integration. So to use the Bhutanese example of becoming Nepali citizens and becoming part of that culture. They're not being given the offer of repatriation, which would be to accept them back into Bhutan. And resettlement seems to be the only offer or option left to them, resettlement being into Canada or resettled into the United States. And another primary characteristic or defining characteristic of this population is that the goal of aid has moved beyond the emergency phase. They're now at a place where they are um, stable somewhat from a health perspective. Their lives are not in imminent danger. Um, there, of course, are the dangers of living in a camp and being a refugee. But that emergency phase has come and gone. When you go to a camp, this, or when you go to one of the camps in Nepal, and usually um, for most refugee camps, the first thing you see are the armed guards when you walk in. And so when I walked in, and they're Nepali uh, soldiers. So I walked in, I asked uh, one of the Nepali soldiers, I said, are you here to protect the refugees or are you here to enforce order upon the refugees? And he said, both. So you have to understand the situation that they're in. It's kind of this tense space. Um, where you're being supervised all the time. You're, yes, you're being given aid, but it's very much kind of a military construct that's overlaying your daily existence. Now, what causes um, a protracted refugee situation? It stems from political impasses that are not inevitable, but rather the result of political action and inaction, both in the country of origin and the country of asylum. I would add to that definition and I'd say that they are not inevitable and they're a result of political action or inaction by the country of origin, the home country, so in the example that we're using, Bhutan, but also of the country of asylum, Nepal, but also of the Western countries who have an influence over this matter, like the United States, like Canada. So our inaction as well is not lost on the international community or the governments of these various countries because our voice is loud, our platform is strong to speak about these issues. So some of the challenges generally that face protracted refugee situations, refugees are trapped um, in situations facing a wide range of protection challenges. Host states increasingly view prolonged, the prolonged presence of refugees as a burden and as a security concern. So you have a situation that always begins humanitarian in nature. Um, so if I'm part of the local population, I say, oh my gosh, this is so horrible that's happening to these people. They're fleeing to our country. We're going to, we're going to give them protection. We're going to set a, help them um, get a better life. I talked to an owner of a tea plantation in the South, and he said to me, it was, it was horrible at the time what was happening. They're all fleeing here. They were in a, a terrible, terrible state, and they set up camp. And by the way, they've stayed, and they're sapping our resources, and they're taking away from the local population what is due to us. So after a period of time, these populations begin to be seen themselves as pariah. And the populations are seen getting aid, getting attention, you know, food, water, things of this nature. And often the local population do not have access to some of the same type of foodstuffs and aid as the people in the camps. And so resentment, animosity builds. So you have an already tense situation becoming um, more tense and adding a political, a domestic political element to it. Finding solutions to these situations have proved elusive for humanitarian actors. What I mean by that is that if you take purely a humanitarian approach, you aren't going to have the tools you need at your disposal to leverage and force a durable solution. Humanitarian approach is one that sustains life. It's not one that also brings in political elements. And so you need a comprehensive uh, multi-prong approach to tackle a, a, a politically different and diverse problem. Again, growing numbers of situations are becoming increasingly protracted all around the world. This is something that is becoming worse and worse. Um, and then there's the issue that the king of Bhutan, Bhutan brought up in his argument. 
that when he said that the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees was actually creating more refugees because um, he was providing such good care for them that other people wanted to come and then he chose to leave. So resettlement offers can create a pull factor where other persons choose to migrate to a refugee camp, thereby exasperating the refugee situation. We can get into the merits of the truth of that statement or not, but it is a perception that exists. This is a picture of all the organizations that provide aid in the camp. Um, United States, obviously, Japan, Australia, Canada, Sweden, Norway, uh, Nepal Investment Bank, uh, the Buddhist Order, Government of Germany, Finland. Um, so many, many organizations, many, many countries coming in to provide aid to this camp in San Shari. Most states that are temporarily housing refugees absolutely require the refugee to stay in the refugee camp. They do not want the refugee leaving. They do not want the refugee getting jobs in the community. They want them to stay there. Um, that poses a problem, obviously, because then the refugees can't build a life, a life for themselves. They can't further develop their skills. They are then, at that point, completely dependent on international actors. And the reason the local country does that is because they don't want them staking a claim to citizenship, um, a de facto claim to citizenship, before that local country has uh, chosen to grant it or not grant it. Also, life in the camp is, um, it's, it's frequent to have high levels of crime, insecurity, violence. There's a denial of rights, including freedom of movement and access to employment, leads to a dependency on uh, dwindling international assistance, especially food. Pressure compounds the vulnerability of particularly uh, vulnerable groups, such as refugee women and children. And here's just some numbers, generally, of the protracted refugee situation around the world. Uh, these numbers are a couple years dated, but it's the most accurate, um, considering the methodology that I thought that I could find um, to, to give you. But they're massive numbers. I mean, some people say it's up to two-thirds of the world's refugee population are in these protracted refugee situations. And part of that is because they're difficult to solve. So it's much easier to go in to find um, a refugee, a refugee community that is, is new, and to resettle them. Because the lack of protractedness means that the possibility for solutions is, is, is more possible. So large populations all over the world, Asia, Africa. A little bit about the U.S. and Canadian resettlement numbers. I pulled FY09 um, because, again, I thought we were getting a little bit closer um, to what is accurate. USA uh, giving refuge, 09, proposed ceiling of 80,000 refugees being taken or resettled in the United States. Um, we actually ended up admitting around 70, a little over 74,000 refugees in the United States. And in addition to that, um, people who were given asylum, about 22,000 people were given asylum in the United States. Almost 100,000 were given protection. And that's a pretty, that seems to be a pretty average uh, or a number representative of the yearly admission uh, goal each year. Canada, refugees admitted about 12,000, asylum about 7,000, protection total about 19,000. So, I mean, the numbers given the populations of the two countries are actually quite high. Um, and so these are quite large programs. I thought this was interesting. These are pictures of ovens in the camps that they use. If you flip them over, it's a, it's a, it's a, a concave metal cylinder and heat uh, gathers in, in the center of it, and it'll boil water, it'll cook food, um, and there's no power source needed, which is outstanding because the camps usually don't have any power whatsoever, um, or at least the populations in the camps don't have access to power. So, resettlement is a dur durable solution to meet need. When choices have to be made, how do we prioritize what populations to be resettled? Regardless if you feel the statement is true or not, it is accepted that there is a saturation threshold for the United States, for Canada, Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, Norway, for refugees, that the countries can only take so many every year. So if we accept that as our truth, then we have to make decisions on what refugees to resettle. 
Obviously, those decisions are being made and we're not prioritizing <coughs> protracted refugee situations because we're seeing them continuingly protracted in nature. So the choices that are made are, do we help people who are in imminent, imminent life-threatening harm, people who are in acute vulnerable